This is the Artillery 3D Sidewinder X1 3D printer. And don't freak out, this may be deja vu for a few of you because I did recently review this machine, I made a video, I uploaded it, and then I took it down. Why did I take it down? Well, I made a few silly mistakes and there's some new information that's come to light since I edited and uploaded that video. Number one is Artillery 3D are rebranding to Evnovo and I call it Envovo. It's still a terrible name, guys. I'm sorry. It's very difficult to pronounce, but I made that mistake. And secondly, there's some information that's come out around the layer inaccuracies I'll describe in this review. And I did a few experiments and tests to try to resolve that and uncovered some additional problems that I really want to include in this review. So without further ado, let's get started. How's it going guys, Angus here from Makers Muse and this is the Sidewinder X1. I'm probably the last to the party for this 3D printer, but that's somewhat intentional. It gives manufacturers time to iron out bugs and issues on release and reviews once released, however, are kind of set in stone. But if I've learned anything, it's that 3D printers never really stop evolving as companies continue to tweak and improve them based on consumer feedback. So what do we have here? Well, for a start, the X1 doesn't even fit into the frame and I've moved the camera way back. It's huge, but thankfully it ships with the gantry disconnected to keep the packaging compact, but you only need to attach a few wires and four bolts to get the machine assembled. You also need to attach this spool holder, which is uh, a little bit more on that later. It uses these ribbon cables everywhere, which keeps wire cluttered to an absolute minimum. And I'll be honest, it looks really sleek. However, I will mention that they are quite fragile and introduce a lot of possible points of failure for the extruder hot end and x-axis wiring and in the box are spare ribbon cables should you run into any issues. This machine is huge with a generous print volume of 300 by 300 by 400 millimeters in the Z. It's one of the largest i3 style printers you can buy and has a direct drive extruder, heated bed, and rigid frame using V rollers. The implementation of these features, however, is done really nicely, unusually so actually. I dislike Bowden extruders and I make no secret of that, but the direct drive here is even more special than most. It's a Titan style extruder using a geared pancake stepper to develop high torque and control in a lightweight package. I do believe it's a clone, however. The print bed is a huge glass plate and it uses that any cubic ultra base style ceramic surface that's really popular now. It heats up stupidly fast thanks to a AC silicon heat mat. Now moving wires carrying mains voltage do scare me a little but the cables used here are really thick and seem pretty durable so I'll be keeping an eye on it but I'm quite satisfied how it's been implemented. If you've never had the pleasure of using a print surface like this here's the deal. Parts stick perfectly while hot, but once it cools, they self-release as if by magic. Getting this to work does require a pretty perfect first layer, however, and leveling is only assisted manual in the stock machine. It's important to do this while the bed is at temperature too, because it's so big and it's a huge glass plate, it actually expands quite a bit as it warms up. I leveled it once and it's been pretty good since, but you can also modify this printer to take a BL touch or similar leveling probe if you so wish. Other creature comforts include filament outage detection, power loss recovery, USB and micro SD card slots, as well as Wi-Fi connectivity if that's more your thing. Seriously, tons of features and way more that I could cover in a concise review. First print was this demo cube on the included flash drive and I joked on Twitter about this, but the demo print really does fly, which is refreshing. Uh, many companies run really conservative print settings on their demo models, but here, nah, they're like, Fang it. Service quality and accuracy was fantastic too, although it's just a tiny print. And something else should be quick to notice, or rather not notice, is the sound. This machine is so quiet, and that's thanks to the silent stepper drivers. Compared to the Anet A8 Plus I recently reviewed, it's like a ghost. You barely know it's on sometimes, and maybe they should have called it that. For my own test prints, I loaded their provided slicer settings into the latest Prusa slicer and made some subtle tweaks of my own to get it to my personal preferences. So I've linked my profile below if you'd like to give it a shot yourself. Onto my test prints and things are a little variable here. I printed this Gayer Anderson cat no less than three times and each time every print turned out a little bit different 
even though they have identical G code. The first one sadly lost adhesion um, and the support column broke free, but it was a very cold evening and you do have to be super close to the plate for adhesion. But second time around in the blue PLA, it almost worked perfect, but the column did semi shift, which is interesting. This is printed at 0.15 millimeter layer heights and there's clearly a little bit of layer variation here. It's still a really great result compared to many other machines I've reviewed, but I can't call it perfect. Getting correct tension on the V rollers is critical for designs like this, but they all seem to roll okay and the print variation isn't consistent with flat spots or damage on the rollers, which would show the same artifacts regularly, the same Z heights. It seems to be something else. Next was this humongous anti oiloid I recently showed off and overall it looks spectacular, but it does have this nasty layer aberration on one of the parts as well, which makes no sense because both halves are identical G code. My hypothesis is that the spool holder and filament sensor putting variable amounts of friction as the filament is fed and to these special couplers for what I assume is to mitigate bent lead screw print issues if you happen to have bent lead screws but as a trade-off result in a bit of play in the gantry. All of this seems to lend itself to slightly random print layer artifacts which are not always present. This Oloid print in silver PLA came out looking absolutely flawless but with the clearance gauge the 0.3 millimeter gap was as low as I could go and I really did expect to get better clearances on this machine. To see just how much of an effect the stock spool holder and filament sensor was having, I whipped up this subtle curved object test and printed it with the stock setup and then with a janky spool holder that I borrowed from another i3. Same g-code and I don't know about you but I can definitely see an improvement here. It might be difficult to pick up on camera but you can even feel the print done with the borrowed i3 spool holder is smoother to the touch than the stock spool holder and filament runout sensor. Lastly, I tried this head bust in Polyacme Elixir from the Scan the World Initiative, and as expected, it looks really clean at first glance, but, and don't mind the line down here, that's just where I put the seam in my settings. But again, closer up, there are layer inconsistencies. Okay, now back to the present. So what did I do to try to resolve the layer inaccuracies on the Artillery 3D Sidewinder X1? Well, number one is I replaced that PTFE tube in the hot end assembly, in the Volcano hot end. The tube that it comes with has a very tight diameter inside, so I replaced it with some Capricorn tubing. It's a little bit different, which should give it a little bit more smoother flowing of the filament into the hot end. I tightened up all the belts, so in terms of the belt adjustment, you can adjust the mounting points for the idlers on the X and Y axis. So I made them as tight as I possibly could. Unfortunately, the couplers, you can't really do anything to them. They're injection molded, there's no adjustment points. So I've left them as is, I haven't you know, gotten rid of them, but I do believe that they're still a source of some of the layer inaccuracies. And this is my result. So comparing it to the version I did with the extra external mounted spool holder and no other changes, it's still very similar. It is a little bit improved. This is what I wanted to see when I was getting those weird layer inaccuracies. So I'm really happy I could remove the bulk of those problems by changing from the stock spool holder to a new spool holder. No filament outage detection now, but you know, I'm keeping an eye on it. So that's a trade off, I suppose. And a few easy tweaks without any real spend. But here's an issue I encountered, which I really did want to include in this review and partly why I took the other video down. It's these ribbon cable mounts. So here's the deal, if you look at a few of the other reviews of the Artillery Sidewind X1, like from Teaching Tech for example, you'll notice that the, the connection points for the ribbon cables have a little black connector cover that sort of clicks down and locks those ribbon cables in place. This machine only has friction fit plugs on all the ribbon cables. And what happens when that connection isn't secure is you'll get an incorrect reading on the thermistor. It'll read as open circuit, which is like negative 15 degrees Celsius. And of course, trigger thermal runaway because it's not reading and thank God it has thermal runaway. Otherwise, there's nothing stopping the hot end from just keep, keep me trying to heat. And secondly, the poles of the pancake stepper will not be connected properly. So the machine will just buzz. And that's really crap. That's a real letdown for reliability on this machine. So originally I thought it was the ribbon cables having an intermittent connection, but it is that plug. I went through every single connection point with a multimeter and narrowed it down to that plug. 
So to fix it, all I've done, and it's really kludgy, is jam something in to press against that connector. So it's pressing the, all the connection points and pins into the ribbon cable. It's not fantastic, it's not perfect, but I can't think of any other solution than to replace that breakout board and get a new plug, which ideally would be like the earlier machines seem to have with that little black latch that compresses the pins into the ribbon cable. So I just wanted to include that in this review, but it's a fantastic printer for the price. My conclusion is the same with a few additional changes like the spool holder and tightening belts. You can get really, really good results off it. I just wish that these ribbon cable connection points were more reliable. That's the only thing letting it down. And the price is also one of the more attractive aspects of the Sidewinder X1. It's priced at 389 USD using the coupon code link below. And that's a pretty good price for an assembled large format printer with awesome electronics. If you'd like to pick up the X1, you can find purchase links below as well as the most recent and best coupon I can find from Gearbest. And full disclosure, Gearbest sent me the Sidewinder X1 for purpose of review, free of charge, and all opinions are my own. Links below are affiliate links, so I do get a little bit if you choose to buy one, but that's totally up to you. And I've also gone ahead and linked to some other great reviews of this printer. If you want further perspectives on, from some of my fellow YouTubers, particularly its capability of 3D printing in flexibles, which I haven't even had a chance to try out yet. If you found this video useful, I would love for you to subscribe. Here on Make His Muse, I do a ton of 3D printer and tech reviews, 3D design tutorials and projects, and it's my aim to empower creativity through technology. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.